uh, asked by Gary to uh, look at the Rambler 100 capsize. I, I became involved with it uh, before the transatlantic race. Uh, I, I helped them David Tuning was the uh, safety officer for the transatlantic race, and I offered to do a seminar for the latecomers at Harbor Court. I had 10 people, one of whom was the uh, young woman that got the severe hypothermia in the incident. And at the same time, they went to the hands-on training. Dan, would you stand up? This is Dan O'Connor. He runs a firm called Life Raft's Survival Equipment in Tiverton, Rhode Island. And he's our primary hands-on instructor. Uh, mentioned hands-on training. It's a requirement internationally to have a hands-on training plus a safety and sea seminar. We have resisted adapting that in this country because it takes two days, quite a bit of time and money to, to put on these productions. What we do is we offer it as an option rather than as a requirement. So far we've had 800 people go through it and it's selling itself. And this is a case where it sold uh, a great deal of safety to the boat Rambler 100. Uh, Dan was asked after our two days of seminars to come out on the boat and he went out for five hours, uh, did actual man overboard and life raft uh, launching and then took home 25 bags of, can you hold the bag up? Took home 25 bags of uh, harness and, and PFDs and, and repackaged them for, uh, for Rambler 100. Put in, put in each one a uh, tether and in each one a package that had two items and three items in it, a warm hat, a strobe light, and a P and a P personal locating beacon. We have examples of those right here. These were packed separately in something called a fanny pack and then installed in the bag. When he when he bought the bag he told the crew that uh, he had attached the leg straps uh, to the to the PFDs and the tethers, and uh, the, some of them did not like that. Many of them roll them up or take them off because they they don't like to have leg or crack straps on them. Uh, they went through the transatlantic. Get this, they crossed the Atlantic in six days and 22 hours. And so basically, they're defending the title of the fastest monohull on Earth. 100 feet long, 21 people aboard. It was built originally by, uh, as a, a boat named Speedboat. And don't get old, you have to wear eyeglasses to read. Did uh, anyone here uh, sail on Speedboat? I know one did. I should have asked, are there any survivors of the Rambler incident uh, in the audience? Um, well, I've talked to uh, all of the people that in inspected the boat before the transatlantic, and I've talked to at least six or seven people that have been on the boat. I have some diagrams and some pictures of the boat. Here it is with the keel, as I call this my before boat. Uh, it was redone as a 100-foot Super Maxi and IRC rated and campaigned by uh, George David and a crew of 21 people, all professionals. It entered the transatlantic race that I told you about. And here it is show going around fast enough. They had reefed down before, the, before the, the rounding. They came onto the rock at speed about 24 knots uh, on a reach. And then they went to a, a, a offset buoy about 15 miles to the southwest of the rock to uh, 
that separates the oncoming from the returning boats. Uh, this is the last known photograph. It was carefully explained to me that uh, this was an ordinary day, 22 knots, 2 meter seas. Uh, it was nothing extreme at all. But what they had done, and this is an RORC run race, Royal Ocean Racing Club, with prescriptions. And the prescription said that whenever the boat is reefed, you must wear your PFD, your, your uh, life jacket. So uh, before they came up, they had several people had discussions. They'll be photographing us when we're around the rock. Get your life jacket on. And that's exactly uh, what they did. They're believers now. They think that's a wonderful rule. And they've recommended that we try to include that in, in the US rules. And that'll come part of one of my recommendations. The track, this is the fast net rock. This is the offset mark. And then the capsize area is here. The wind, was, I can't make that arrow twist for some reason. So I, uh, the wind was veering. And this partially explains why the follow-on boats was not, were not able to, to see them. The uh, boat, uh, I kept leopard grounded the rock 34 minutes after they did. And it, it went on, on its leg, it passed the upturned boat about 300 meters. Now you have to realize that the, the weather is very iffy, fog, uh, it's very noisy, but there were 16 people on, on the top of the boat that were screaming, using flashlights and whistles, and all trying to get attention of sea level. What I didn't tell you is all 21 got out. Five were separated from the boat. And they followed the rule that they were taught of staying together. And they were taught to survive in a circle so that they would, and this is the hands-on training that Dan gave them uh, over to, and they received this internationally as well. So what happened, this is hard to see, I'm afraid. The, on the left, you see the fracture of the hull. Canting keel, water ballasted boat. Keel breaks off, 15 tons of keel goes to the bottom. Water ballast, the boat goes to a, the mass goes in the water, and just as a, a dimension with the boat on its beam, the people on the lifeline, the high side, were 20 feet above the water. So they, uh, the stanchion started to pop under the weight of the people. And then they walked down the boom and, and individually calculated. And this is something that has come out over and over again. It wasn't that they practiced anything or they were professionals, they were athletes. They, they were thinking calmly, no panic, and, and each one of them told their story in a narrative. When I first was asked to do this, I made up a questionnaire to, to go to each crew member, and I went to the owner and said, uh, this, this questionnaire asks, you know, where you were, what you were doing, how you survived, whether you helped others, whether others helped you. Uh, and I also said to him that I would not tell a narrative with, with names and that I was not interested in selling a story or writing an article. That uh, I was taught in the Navy when you have an accident to uh, go into the room, close the door, and figure out what happened before you figure out who's fault it is. And as it would happen, uh, when I had a fellow on the pier with me in Newport that had done investigations on aircraft carriers, so he went over my questionnaire with me and we thought it was pretty good. But this would happen uh, when I approached uh, George David, he had already sent the questionnaire out with almost all the questions that I had asked. So uh, we struck a deal that these personal narratives, 21 narratives, uh, would, would be my major source for this review.
People started falling in the water, jumping in the water. Down below, there were four people in the bunk and two people uh, at the nav table. Uh, they were able to get out, all of them, in one way or another. But the key was they couldn't bring or anything with them because there was no time to put boots on or anything else. They just had to get out. And uh, the last story that was told, I think uh, Peter Eisler, the navigator, told, uh, told the story pretty vividly about how he was the last one to go out. He uh, tried to issue a mayday, and then uh, when he couldn't, uh, he didn't get any response. He took, he took the handheld and thought he would uh, do it, but then he realized, I better get out of here. So he swam with the handheld, but on the way up, he dropped it. So on top of the boat, there were only two PLVs. I started by saying that uh, every person was given a personal locating beacon. They were given it in a fanny pack, which they chose not to wear. Only two people took it out of the pack, put it in their pocket, or in their foul weather gear. And they were the only two pieces of electronics that went that, that sent a signal out. Then this became an issue. It's an Australian built personal locating beacon uh, filled out on a NOAA form uh, with a point of contact, uh, G.G. Bernard, who was the personal assistant of George David in Hartford, Connecticut. And the rescue forces thought they were looking for a boat named, or a person named Gigi Bernard. And uh, there was a lot of uh, confusion on that. So there was, the mayday was not sounded by anyone for an hour and three quarters while they sorted out the difference. The hero in that was the navigator of the ICAP Leopard who got on the radio with the Coast Guard and told them that they had lost AIS contact, gave them the cell phone number so that they could try, or the uh, satellite phone number, and then finally it convinced them that uh, there was no visual, no VHF contact. So eventually they sounded a mayday, which uh, seemed to change the uh, way people were uh, sailing by because the boats started to come over and to look. At the same time, there was a life boat, this is the Royal Navy Life Institute of R and National, thank you, National Life Boat Institute. A boat was underway with photographers at the rock. There was an off-duty coxswain of one of those boats in his private dive boat uh, with another group of people. So when, when they sounded a pond pond, they, they were diverted to look. They went into a search pattern, the, the uh, lifeboat did, and came right towards the Rambler 100. And everybody thought, oh, here we were rescued. And about 100 yards away, they turned and continued their search pattern. It wasn't until they came back the next time that they were discovered. Rumor has it as they were down below trying to RDF on the 121.5 beacon that's in the uh, in each PLB. When they came alongside, ultimately they asked, "Where's Gigi Bernard?" They really didn't. They they were quite surprised that they were, they came upon an upturned boat. Uh, meanwhile, the five people that are floating off staying together, trying to huddle and keep each other warm and to keep the morale up. They saw ICAP Leonard come and they said, oh, they see us because they're all on deck lowering the sail. But they didn't see them. They were, they were reefing. So they didn't have any way of signaling, any way of electronically calling, and basically no communications with up to seven boats that went past. Here are the 16 people that, as they were discovered by the uh, lifeboat. 
Uh, their, their first indication was to go find the people in the water. And they went off for a moment, but the Coast Guard sent them back uh, to do the rescue of the 16 because they had the other boat uh, doing a search for them. Uh, they wanted to bring the boat alongside the upturned vessel, and the people on Rambler said, no, yeah, that won't work. So they negotiated. This is the negotiation period here. Uh, and they decided to blow up a dinghy, and one by one, they walked them over in what one narrative called Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, followed by a mauling to get them aboard. This is the way it looked. Uh, this I call this the after picture. Everyone that looked at this said that the uh, keel was still on, but that's not a keel, that's a dagger board. There were two dagger boards, one was deployed at the time. You can see there's a list on the boat because the water balance uh, is in the uh, port side. The, meanwhile, three hours later, the rescue boat wave chieftain came alongside and threw a line. Mr. David caught the line, and uh, this is what endears me to the man. He said, I want my crew out before you bring me up. So uh, I, I met him with that greeting that I wanted to you know, meet somebody like that, and we have a good relationship uh, in terms of telling me and showing me and giving me anything I want uh, on, this, on this review. Uh, but they had an electronic or a hydraulic lift that they usually bring divers out of the water. And they, one by one, they brought the, the people up. Uh, except Wendy, you can see some of the blue in the face. These are very difficult photographs uh, to, to project this, this far. But uh, they called the helicopter in uh, right away to take her off. And Mr. David was very pleased, as CEO of United Technology, to hide a Sikorsky helicopter to the rescue. He's quite, quite, he, knew, he knew more about the helicopter than, than anything else. But uh, then they rendezvoused the two boats and, and proceeded to Baltimore to a sailing club in Baltimore. And I've been to that club. It's a very wonderful club. And uh, they, they gave them food, drink, and two homes to live in. Okay, and now we get to the review. I went over the following things. Crew narratives were the biggest. And I use the, many of the advisors here that I work with all the time to sound off, you know, and tell me, this is a new experience for me. How do you, how do you live on a boat with 21 professionals? And uh, what's the organization like? And, and how come they didn't have their life jackets one place or another? And it's, it's, all, it's all explained very well. But what should you as a sailor learn? Love your combination life jacket and harness. Learn to carry more safety equipment than is put onto the life jacket. And learn something about abandonment and, and water survival. Life jacket itself is required, and a harness, as of 2011, January of this year, every harness is required to have a, a crutch strap on it. And uh, thigh straps is another alternative. And then every person is supposed to have a, a tether as well. Now, the reason that all of this emphasis is and this is a quote from Mr. Mr. David's in the report. A life jacket isn't on until it's complete with the fitting and adjustment, crotch straps included, and your PLV and your strobe are on your person. The tether and the harness must be attached, but not necessarily hooked on. In other words, when they got in the water, they didn't have any way to tie each other together because they didn't have tethers with them. So this tether subject that Chuck brought up came out in this, along with the comment that tethers really aren't hacking it. They're not popular. Uh, and I have several examples. I think Stan sent me one made out of Spectre where it's very light, except for the hook. Uh, the industry is trying to satisfy the requirements, but uh, 
according to the sampling that I have, uh, they're not that pleased with the, with the product. Uh, you mentioned the uh, difficulty of releasing at the body. I have a whole lecture on tethers, but I, I simply said it's, uh, it, it is meeting the needs right now. What the recommendation that the people, uh, I've taken mostly crew recommendations and added some of my own uh, from my experience with the offshore special regulations. I, I, didn't, I don't think I've admitted that, but I'm the editor, the U.S. editor of the offshore special regulations. And so uh, I'm, uh, I know quite a bit about what's in them and what isn't. And I'm a student of the uh, offshore uh, races. Uh, be, even before this race, I had downloaded the notice of race and I know that what the ROC prescriptions, uh, you know, how they change the international requirements. But wearing crotch and thigh straps is, is, definite, is definitely emphasized by everybody that came out of this experience. Carrying the tether, I mentioned that. Whistles and lights are useless. It's what they said. And for years I've been carrying around, you know, a whistle. I call, I call people into the seminar with it. And I say, wouldn't this sound better? Or do you think you would hear this one? So, you know, it's just three samples. And this goes through a lot of the personal equipment. Go into the lights, the same story. Uh, I have a life jacket here, similar to what every person had on board. Uh, if you put the bulb in the water, the light goes on. If you climb up on the hull like they do it, the light goes on. And, and you have to know your personal equipment. Every life jacket on that boat was disabled from the automatic feature. There's a cap put on the end, the automatic inflation system. In other words, they were only manually activated. In one case, the fellow that was down below came swimming out. He took his life jacket off and linked it on his arm because he couldn't remember whether he had an automatic inflatable or not. And in, in another case, uh, an individual said he jiggered his, uh, his CO2 canister in his life jacket if he had an automatic one, which means he unscrewed the CO2 so it wouldn't go off when he didn't want it to go off. So uh, there's something to be learned there about the choice of life jackets, having the choice of when you want to be, have it automatic or manual. That's probably the most significant point. The get to know your own PFK and inspect it. How many here have its, uh, inflatable life jackets? Quite a few. How many have opened them up, blown them up, and left them overnight? Ah, oh, great, great. Must have been to one of my lectures before. <laughs> but to almost every group, uh, Every year you should inflate your, your inflatable, fill it up, and see if it just lasts the night. Here I am in my best, the Spidlock. Uh, there are three kinds of crotch straps available in our market, add-ons by Mustang and by uh, suspenders. And in the middle you see the uh, Spidlock that can either be put on as a crotch strap or a uh, thigh strap. This is Splash guard was another thing. Three people put the splash guard over their face of the five that were in the water. Now most people say, what is a splash guard? Here is a splash guard pulled over the face. And uh, my wife calls that the Kevorkian vest. But uh, it, 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 it takes, the, it takes the, the splash out of the water. Mind you, they're in, in 10 feet seas these five people. The people that didn't put them on, the two started barfing because they were drinking so much salt water. And uh, they, they said they didn't want them on because they wanted to be a, have a lookout. But uh, eventually one of them succumbed and put it on because he couldn't take, a, take it in the face any longer. 
recommended safety equipment. These are things that are not required, but things that, that you should think about. The American sailor should think about. No one had any flares. They had had a discussion. And Dan, I think you told me this story. The idea was to get the laser flare, see walking around the room here. That can be seen 20 miles. And uh, I carry that personally instead of the uh, small mini pocket flares. But when I did a transatlantic, I bought a half a dozen of them. Always tie them on a string so that you don't lose them in the water, but have some way of doing visual in the daytime and at nighttime. I have a mirror and, and, and flares. Okay. They had PLBs, personal locating beacons. Uh, looking into this right now, next Volvo is requiring a PLB that's AIS based. So I think we're going to see something in the marketplace on that. Uh, the PLB problem that they had was that the registration through NOAA uh, did not mention the fast that race, did not mention the boat's name. So there's a, I've gone into the form and it's an individual responsibility. The owner of the PLB, most of the times these young people bring these aboard themselves have to go on the internet to update the, where they are so that the, when, if their beacon goes off that the, the rescue authority doesn't have to struggle the way these fellows did in Ireland. Boat's name. The other thing that's really uh, coming into itself not as rapidly as they would like is the Coast Guard uh, it, it has finished installing better antennas and uh, they, this is a DSC capable radio, a uh, handheld radio that, that can, if, if you press the red button on the side, it, will, it would uh, sound an alarm on all of the vessels within VHF range. That digital selective calling was installed in the, in the Rambler but was not used. The other thing that was installed but not turned on was the SATCOM C, which has a red button. Uh, so, one of the things that I learned in the Navy is you always turn everything on before you get underway. And uh, usually we don't get underway until everything's working properly. But uh, that, if either one of those had been pushed, then the racing fleet would have known about the incident. As it was, the only people that knew about the incident was the shore establishment. And they, had, they weren't even aware that there was a race. The, the rescue. Thank you. Uh, before you can use a digital selective calling, you have to have an MMSI. On the long distance boats that go to different countries, that's part of your uh, station license. Uh, if you don't know what it is, it's, it, it really is something that you should write down and go look, look for a digital selective calling. Because what I did is bring this from the cruising side. When we do what was talked about last night, they suddenly alone come. We'd say to the couple, if you get into trouble, you don't have to say anything on the radio. You go over and push the button for five seconds automatically in less than a second. It says who you are, where you are, what your problem is. And, and it's, it's, has anyone heard the digital alarm go off? They're, they're very loud. The way the radios are built, they go off and then they increase in volume they can't be turned off, they can't be timed out. You, in an emergency, the person has to go to the other radio to, uh, to, to see why it's beeping. And uh, we require this now in the Bermuda race. It's going to be a requirement and then a recommendation in this report that we, that we do that uh, internationally, actually. Abandoned ship. The lesson there is to learn, you went as you were, close or not. Stay with the boats, the primary thing, but if you can't, stay together. 
These are things that came right out of the narratives. I didn't write any of this. I just selected the, the things that they said. In the, when you stay together, you need to learn about helping heat, escape, lessening position, buddy straps. All of these PFDs have a buddy strap on something that you can latch on to. Uh, but not many people know it. It's not well advertised. The recommendations, so they're not required. Many times they're not even taught. Plug in that course again. Hands-on course. It's going to be a recommendation uh, that we make this a requirement and let the yacht clubs that are running offshore races wave it if they want to. I have recommendations in, in five different areas. Training, what you can read. Training, start teaching people three functions to a mayday. Press the red button, a voice call, and an ebro. And then require the survival course attendance for category one and two. Safety equipment. We have a dilemma internationally with ISO standards defining what a life jacket is. And we have waivers in the US allowing us to use an inferior life jacket because it's Coast Guard approved. And I'm looking at my Coast Guard liaison here. Uh, we, we've had a hard time coming to grips with this. It's political. Uh, we've written, the Safety C Committee writes prescriptions to allow the U.S. Coast Guard approved PFD to satisfy the international requirement. But it's nowhere near the, the international requirement. So we, we need to solve that problem somehow. Uh, having the option of selecting auto or manual. When reef, we already have about five different conditions in the U.S. sailing prescription, cold water, fog, foul weather, uh, but adding when reefed, uh, our RC goes at it a different way. They have reefed when the true wind is over 25 knots. So uh, we're, we're going to have to revisit our, our recommendation, uh, which is uh, in the form of prescription. And we need to get the word out that the whistles uh, aren't, aren't as good as they should be and do whatever we need to do in terms of studying tethers. One of the things that came out several times was before the race to put your equipment on and then to take it off and stow it where you know you're going to find it. Now this came into effect in, in this boat of this size because they have a, a salon which is about 20 feet wide and they have hooks all around it, and they try to keep wet gear on, on the hooks. So the fellows in the bunk didn't have their, uh, didn't have their uh, PFDs, and they came out with the boat sideways, and they made a conscious and a good decision not to go after the PFB to get the hell out. And uh, they went right through the hatches. e -perbs, uh, we still allow e -perbs. takes two hours to get a fix from rotating satellites. We shouldn't be requiring what I call g -perbs, e -perbs with a GPS in them. So it takes minutes and it, it's a, a tighter circle, a two-mile circle. Uh, it's, and it, it, it takes the search out of search and rescue. We now have e -perbs on a list that the, the race organizers are supposed to give to SAR authorities. Uh, I don't think it would be that much more difficult to tell them what PLBs are in the fleet as well. What I'm going to do with these is submit them as submissions to the Safety at Sea Committee and, and then let them discuss it, vote on it, forward it to the Board of U.S. Sailing for approval. Uh, if we, if we Prove it at that level, we can implement it in the U.S. as a prescription and send it to the international body for consideration for changes. They did not have any deeper topside. Everybody asks, why didn't they? Anything you put topside on that boat gets washed away, basically. 
Uh, they could not launch life rafts in, from the inverted position. They could not get anything off the boat from the inverted position. Uh, there's a, that's a, a, another recommendation is to require access from an inverted position. That's the next one. Second part of uh, the communications is that the AIS uh, should be turned on continuously before the start till after the finish. Most of the races are adding that, but it's still not a requirement. And along with that, uh, it's felt that the AIS should be have an antenna on the masthead instead of on the rail. Because you get into heavy seas like this, you lose the AIS. You can find big ships all right, but you can't find the other competitors. Have you had that experience? Not in your head, yes. Okay, there, there, is a, there is a section that applies to uh, movable and variable ballast boats in the, in the international regulations, but it doesn't say anything about inverted boats. So uh, it's felt by the crew, particularly uh, of the Rambler, that they want to be able to climb back on the boat if it's upside down. They couldn't do that. The only way they got on is one of the guys that did the high side walk. Uh, as the boat turned, he walked up over the lifeline. He happened to have a sheet uh, wrapped around his leg, and he reached down and grabbed it, and that was the only line that they used sort of as a jack line between the dagger board and the rudder that those 16 people uh, kept on the board. At one point in time, they had a big ooching exercise because they were starting to list too much. So they said, okay, they were really well organized. And throughout the narratives, they were very personally concerned about each other. And uh, this, was, this was the beautiful part of the story. I mean, they helped each other, they watched each other, they took clothes off and put them on the guys that didn't have clothes and stuff like that. I mean, that, that's a real, uh, real testimony there. But uh, again, hidden in the RRC prescriptions is a recommendation that you have access to a grab bag. So you can't penalize somebody for not doing a, a recommendation. But uh, if they had had that, they might have had a radio or an EPIRB in a grab bag that they could have gotten from, uh, from the inverted position. But they, they had nothing except the clothes on their back. Same thing with a raft. And they didn't have any, uh, here's a foggy, white, foggy day with the boats overturned, a white bottom. You couldn't see it. Uh, we, we have testimony from people that sailed past uh, a lot of the blogs, the guys came on and said, hey, we didn't see them. And the other thing, when the ICAP Leopard passed them, they had legs in, inboard, so their back would have been to them. It just blew my mind that, you know, two or three hundred yards away, you couldn't signal them. What they finally did to signal the lifeboat that came after them, they took two or three of their trim lights and taped them together, or held them together, and shined them to, to, to get the attention of the lifeboat as it went by. I'm just about, I'm just about finished. I did not try to analyze the keel failure. The boat's going in Gosport. The uh, keel is being studied by, or the stump is being studied by Southampton University. And mind you, we were not the race organizers, so we really didn't have a lot of business getting into that type of thing. RRC has formed their own investigation, and the Irish Coast Guard has done their investigation. And so uh, these are the questions that are not yet answered. The report itself is in this format and available online. And part of the interview, I realized how many people are fond of fast and rock. So I went home and dug up my own photo that we used for a Christmas card in the 90s when we had our boat over there. Second time we were there, we couldn't see it, it was too foggy. Here's a picture, I'm gonna click, click, click through a couple things. Here's a picture of the, the main salon. There's 12 feet in that picture. That's half of the beam of the boat. The PFD is hanging in a bag, the one that I showed you here. Uh, here's the way that people sleep. They basically dry uh, and they go to the high side. 
So the bumps are on at the right side up, they would go up through the companionway. Turn it sideways, they drop down 20 feet. Or they go out to the right through the companionway. Put it upside down, they come out, walk across the ceiling, and dive down to get out. This is the other access to the nav station. Uh, eventually, two or three of them had to come aft to get out through the nav station. This is what it looks like from topside. That's it.